by decreasing the number of paths that the electron can take to get somewhere, I can increase the probability that it gets there. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. You know, uh, when they announced this talk, they called it the quantum computing hoax. And I said, please change that. Uh, quantum computing is not a hoax. Uh, it's just one of the, mis one of the most <coughs> mispopularized and misexplained uh, topics in the history of science. And so I'm just going to try to set things straight, that's all. Uh, but uh, I've, uh, you know, I spent uh, 25 years uh, doing research and you know the capabilities and limits of quantum computers. Uh, most, more recently I, I went on leave uh, to work for uh, two years at, at OpenAI on uh, uh, how can we use theoretical computer science to help prevent AI from destroying the world. Uh, I didn't figure that out by the way. Uh, I, have, I, have, I have a few more months to try to, 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 try to solve that. But you know, I've, I've seen uh, uh, ju uh, just how different these fields are. You know, I tell people uh, in, in quantum computing, you know, my main public role in the world for 20 years, especially with my blog, has just been to uh, say to people like, look, I'm sorry you know, despite what you've heard, quantum computing probably will not speed up your, you know, machine learning or uh, uh, industrial optimization application or whatever. And if you give me an hour, I can explain exactly why. Uh, and, and now I have a new role, which is to tell people, yeah, generative AI probably will change your application beyond recognition, uh, but I can't explain why. <laughs> uh, no one knows why. Okay, no one knows why it works. Okay, so but uh, uh, quantum computing, you know, the uh, as 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 you're going to see, you know, the applications of it that we know of uh, are rather specialized, uh, much more specialized than than uh, uh, many of the the uh, uh, business people in in this field would uh, would like it to be. Uh, but the good news is that we understand a lot, and uh, there is some really really profound science uh, at the intersection of physics and computer science. So, um, so let me try to tell you why the reality of it is even more interesting than science fiction. Uh, so uh, in order to uh, uh, you know, explain what a quantum computer is or even what it would be good for, uh, the first step is you have to step back and say, say something about what is quantum mechanics. Right, and so like I, every week I'm on the phone with journalists who are saying, you know, for some quantum computing piece, like, you, you know, can you just explain in one sentence what a quantum computer is? And I'm like, I've been doing, you know, I've been doing this for, for decades, uh, can I have 10 minutes? You know, so, uh, uh, so, you know, a quantum computer is a device that would uh, exploit the laws of quantum mechanics, which we've, you know, known for a century, uh, to solve certain specific problems uh, much faster than we know how to solve them with any conventional computer. Okay, and so uh, what is quantum mechanics? So, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, you, know you, you may have heard, okay, it's, you know, don't even try to understand it. It's mysterious. It's, you know, you have to study for years and it says particles can be everywhere at the same time and there's spooky action at a distance and, uh, uh, um, um, okay, I'm, I'm here to tell you quantum mechanics is actually much, much simpler than you might imagine uh, once you take the physics out of it. Okay, so uh, as, as, as we like to do in computer science. Okay, so the way that you know, we think about quantum mechanics is it's a, it's a certain, I, I think the correct way actually, many of the physicists also think about it this way now, it's a certain generalization of the rules of probability. Okay, so what is probability? Uh, you know, you're not certain about what you're gonna see when you look at something, so you assign a list of numbers to all the possible things that you could see. Okay, these are real numbers from zero to one. You know, they should all add up to one. We call them the probabilities, okay? Like 70% chance of rain tomorrow. You know, who knows what chance of Trump winning the election. Okay, these are probabilities, okay? But you would never talk about a negative 30% chance of rain tomorrow. That would be nonsense. Much less would you talk about, you know, an I, you know, square root of minus 1% chance, okay? But uh, the key thing that quantum mechanics says is that to every possible state, that a system could be in. So like every possible way we could see it when we look, we have to assign a number called an amplitude. Okay? And amplitudes uh, can be positive or negative. They can even be complex numbers. 
Okay, so they are very related to probabilities. The further an amplitude is from zero, the more likely you are to see your, your object in that state, uh, but they're not probabilities. Uh, they work differently. Okay, so uh, the most famous illustration of this is the two-slit experiment, uh, about which Richard Feynman used to say that all of quantum mechanics is contained in this one experiment. Okay, this is the thing where you take uh, particles, like let's say electrons, that uh, for my purposes is what an electron looks like, and you, know, you just shoot them one by one into a screen with two small slits in it, and then you look at where it ends up on a second screen. Okay, and you know, it can diffract, so you, know, you, can, uh, you can repeat over and over with exactly the same starting state, and you might find the electron in a, in a different place each time. It can be probabilistic, okay, and, you know, and we all heard that, that you know, Einstein didn't like, that God plays dice, and Bohr said to Einstein, you know, top, uh, stop telling God what to do. Okay, but you know, I'm here to tell you that the, the, the probabilistic nature is not by itself the disturbing part, right? You could cook up you know, 20 uh, explanations before breakfast where, okay, the, the electron just goes one way or the other based on some secret information that we don't get to see. Uh, the surprising part is what we have to do to calculate the probabilities, okay? And, and in particular, what we see is that um, there are certain dark spots on the second screen where uh, the electron never wants to appear, right? It just you know, almost never appears in those spots. And yet, if I were to close off one of the slits, then the electron can appear in those spots. Okay, so by decreasing the number of paths that the electron can take to get somewhere, I can increase the probability that it gets there. Okay, so now this is not a question of details of, of physics. This is a question of the laws of probability that you thought, okay, being violated. Okay, uh, you know, you, you would have thought that the probability that you see, you know, the, a particle somewhere uh, on, on this screen, you know, no matter what the, the complicated details, at any rate, it's got to be the probability that it reaches that spot by going through this hole, plus the probability that it reaches the spot by going through that hole. Right? And yet that is not what we find when we do the experiment. We find that opening more slits can decrease the chance. Okay, the way that quantum mechanics explains that is that really what's, what's going on is that we need to look at an amplitude for the uh, uh, electron to end up somewhere. And uh, the amplitude is, can be a sum of contributions from all the possible paths that the electron could have taken to reach that spot. Okay, but I told you that amplitudes don't have to be positive, right? So if an electron could reach a spot one way via a path with a positive amplitude, and a different way via a path with a negative am amplitude, then those two contributions can, as we say, interfere destructively and cancel each other out. With the result being that the total amplitude is zero, which means that the electron can never be found there. Okay? If I close one of the slits, now the amplitude is posit only positive or only negative, and now it can appear there. Okay, so uh, uh, in some sense, everything you have ever heard about the weirdness of the quantum world, okay, whether it's entanglement or tunneling or any of it, it is all this one weird trick. Okay? It's, you know, it's not a bunch of different things. It's just all downstream consequences of this one change to the rules of probability. Okay? You know, physicists might make you study for years before they would let, initiate you into that secret. Since I'm a computer scientist, I can just tell you the secret immediately. <laughs> Okay, so you know, here are the rules, right? Uh, uh, you know, if, if a system can be in two distinguishable states, which we label by zero and one, and this is just a notation that the physicists use, it's called KETS, these, these kind of angle brackets, uh, then it can also be in what we call a superposition. Superposition just means uh, 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 I've got some amplitude for the state zero and some amplitude for the state one. And as long as this is the, a superposition of zero and one is the simplest interesting quantum system, we call it a quantum bit or a qubit. 
Okay, and this is the basic building block of a quantum computer. Uh, now, physically, a qubit could be all sorts of things. Like zero could represent the ground state of an electron. One could represent the first excited state. Or zero could represent a nucleus spinning clockwise about some axis. One could represent it spinning counterclockwise about that axis, right? I just need two distinguishable states of, a, of, of some system. Just like a classical bit could be instantiated by voltages uh, in a transistor, but also by billiard balls or by all kinds of other things. Okay, and um, so these numbers, alpha and beta, uh, these are what we call the amplitudes. Okay, they, uh, 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 the, so, so, so they're a vector, okay, a list of two numbers, and they're a unit vector, meaning the length is one. Okay, that is what makes uh, the pro that's what's going to make the probabilities add up to one. Okay, because now there's a rule for what happens when you look. Okay, when you make a measurement, when you sort of interact your qubit with a larger measuring apparatus, and what happens is that nature is forced to make up its mind about which state the qubit should be in. Should it be zero or one? And it makes that choice randomly, but according to a very precise rule. This is called the Born rule, okay, one of the most important rules in all of physics. Uh, it says that the state, uh, uh, nature snaps to one of the two outcomes, to zero with probability that's equal to the squared absolute value of alpha, and one with probability equal to the squared absolute value of beta. Okay, and whichever choice it makes, it then sticks with it. Okay, so you know, if it picks zero and you ask again, well, it's still zero. Okay, uh, uh, so you know, being in superposition is a thing that qubits only like to do in private. Okay, <laughs> they, don't, they don't like to be watched while they're doing it. Uh, but now, if your qubits are isolated, then what happens is that these amplitudes, this list of amplitudes, will evolve in time by, uh, by, by a different rule, okay? uh, by some kind of linear transformation. Okay? So basically, you, you, uh, for those who uh, 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 know these words, you take the vector, the list of amplitudes, and it gets multiplied by some matrix. Okay, to get a new vector. Okay, it could be any uh, 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 linear transformation that, that always preserves the length of the vector. We call those unitary transformations. Okay, and, uh, um, and, you know, and this leads to different behavior than, than you could have in, in the classical world with, with classical probabilities. Okay, but now the, the, the key point you know, is, is uh, if I have more than one qubit, well, let's, let's say I have two qubits, for starters, okay? Now, uh, I cannot just write down amplitudes separately for the first qubit and for the second, okay? The rules are unequivocal that I have to write down an amplitude for every possible state of all of the qubits together. So if I had two qubits, then now I need an amplitude for 0, 0, and an amplitude for 0, 1, and an amplitude for 1, 0, and an amplitude for 1, 1. Okay, if I had three qubits, I need eight amplitudes. Okay, if I had four, I need 16. Uh, if I have 20 qubits, that's more than a million amplitudes. Okay, if I have 1,000 qubits, now the number of amplitudes is more than the number of atoms in the observable universe. Okay, it's two to the thousand power. Okay, and yet uh, um, um, quantum mechanics has told us for a century that, you know, just to maintain the state of, let's say, 1,000 uh, a nuclei that could be spinning one way or the other, nature has to maintain those two to the thousand parameters. You know, if you like, on some hidden scratch paper somewhere that we don't get to see. Okay, and uh, anytime something happens to those nuclei, nature has to cross off all those two to the thousand numbers and replace them with new numbers. Okay, so uh, 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 that is a staggering amount of effort for nature to be going to, you know, just to keep track of the states of a, a thousand measly particles. Um, uh, and, and yet, you know, this is what we need to posit in order to explain the probabilities of the outcomes that we actually see when we look. Okay, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's been known for a long time, but it was, not a, uh, um, it was known mostly as a practical problem. If you're trying to simulate quantum mechanics with a classical computer, you know, you, 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 it's very, very expensive. because Even a small molecule can have this enormous list of amplitudes that you've got to keep track of. And the chemists and physicists have invented all sorts of hacks 
approximation methods for dealing with that. Okay, but in the 80s, a uh, few physicists, most famously Richard Feynman and David Deutsch, uh, had the remarkable idea that, well, if nature is giving us that computational lemon, why don't we make lemonade out of it? Okay, so why don't we build a computer that itself would uh, uh, um, be made of qubits, uh, would be able to exploit this exponentiality of amplitudes, um, and, and, uh, and let's call that a quantum computer. Now, uh, uh, of course, they face the question, supposing that we built that, uh, what would it be good for? Okay, now at the time, they were only able to give one answer to that question, which is, well, it would be good for simulating quantum mechanics itself. Okay, now, 40 years later, I think that remains the best answer that we have. Okay, you know, uh, we have discovered some other answers, and, uh, and I'll talk about that. But, uh, um, okay, but now, uh, uh, once quantum computing sort of exploded into the public consciousness, which, you know, followed some, some dramatic discoveries in the mid-1990s, then a certain narrative took hold in the popular press, which just gets endlessly repeated, right? And, and my blog just became, you know, uh, uh, widely read, the extent it is, just because, like, I was the one person willing to explain to the public that this narrative was wrong, you know? It wasn't even controversial among, you know, experts. You just had to s tell people. Okay, so let me first tell you what the, what the misleading narrative says. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.